Ladies and gentlemen, Yafet Koto. Men and women of Chile Theater, Yafet Koto. Thank you for taking the time to come and join us and answer a few questions. Um, I'll start with a basic one. What's at an event like this, what's the question people ask you the most about a particular movie? You recall? Not really a thing. People have something to say. They have something to say about the movies. They say, oh, I loved it. You were good in it. They're commenting about it. the movie and yourself. Something really ask a question. Do you get more questions? Or what I think what I'm trying to say is do you get the majority of questions about Alien? Are you involved in that film? About the movie or about your role in the movie? No. Hmm? Again, they, they, the only thing that people want to know is what was, what was our reaction, and did we know the chess person or our parade players? That's the one. But people have comments about the movie, they, they, how they felt at the time, and not realizing how they felt, but at the time, how we felt when we were making it. How did you first become interested in acting as a child? What, when did you first begin acting? You've had such a long career. I was 18 years old and I decided to quit school, which everyone was against, and I quit. And uh, the day before I quit, I had just come from uh, looking for a job in a section of Manhattan called Warren Street. And Warren Street is a place where you can buy a job for 10 bucks, a day job. And so I bought this day job and um, delivering lunches. And I delivered a lunch at BBD and all. And I'm walking down 59th Street heading towards, I decided to go to a movie on 42nd Street. As I'm walking down Broadway, I look and I can see this tall guy walking towards me, wearing a green suit, I don't forget it. And I go, oh wow, that's Sydney Bonnier. And I stood there looking at this guy. And as he walked past me, and an energy started to build in this inside me. I said, oh. And then I said, I can, I can be like that. And from that day on, I became like, I'm going to be like that. And uh, stopped thinking about being a jet pilot and a cop and finishing school. And I said, I'm going to give this all my energies. And I'm quitting school. I quit school, and then I started the process of, of getting trained to become an actor. That's how I started. You started out on stage, is that where you first began acting? Yeah. It's, it, following summers, one thing led after another. <clears throat> My mother was on welfare. And our welfare agent came out of projects in Saudi to, uh, to, to every, every few months they check on the family to see that you didn't have a TV or a phone. So my mother said, the, the agent is coming. Put away the big truck of phones. It's hidden away and get the TV to put in your closet. And he came by. And his name was Benjamin Ashburn. 
he went in my room and he saw some writing at that time. He said, you do this. I said, what you want to be? I said, an actor. He said, come with me. I went with him. Downstairs in his car was another black kid. He was taking us somewhere. And the kid introduced himself to me as Lionel Richie. <laughs> took, he took Lionel to, uh, he was taking Lionel somewhere and he took me to his aunt's house. And his aunt had uh, a summer theater on Cape Cod where they produced plays. And she introduced me, she said, Betty tells me you want to be an actor. So I said, yeah. So he said, she sold this play at me called Othello. You think you can play it in part? I, of course, like being a fool, I said, yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> and just desperate. Well, the next thing you know, I'm on Cape Cod, working near in her cottage and preparing to be an actor. And Lionel was, was being prepared to be a singer in the group. And that one man, Betty and I swear to God, rest his soul, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be sitting at this table and Lionel wouldn't be doing it. He said, well, he said, I never asked for anything as a result. He said, well, and that's how I'm sitting here. Um, I like. I guess both of us want to ask you about certain key films and maybe if you had a thought about them. Across 110th Street, um, is there anything you recall about that movie in particular, or maybe Anthony Quinn was the other lead in that film? You know, um, the, thing, the thing about Across 110th Street, one thing led to another. Uh, my performance in a play led to a movie and a movie another movie and then finally of course kind of century from nothing but from from Othello to Othello as a film. Judy Holiday saw Othello. He performed Othello and he decided she was to produce it into a movie. And we produced it into a movie. And that led to a film called Nothing But a Man. And nothing but a man that's a cross kind of century. Uh, what I didn't know at the time that these films are country man, living that time, alien, bone, what they were doing was changing the entire character of the black male. Didn't know it. Liberation of Lord Byron Jones was the first time in film history that a black man kill the white man without any feeling in crime in the colonized. Living at that time was the first time a black man was seen on the screen. Alien, the first time a black man was seen in space. Bone, the first time a black man was seen making love to a Caucasian woman. These films completely turned the entire industry around. Wayne Wyler said to me, what are you going to do? He said, you know you've been put in a strange position. And I read Wilder and uh, two former female Hollywood superstars <coughs> told me not to produce, promote myself. Don't, don't promote, don't do any good with it. <coughs> that came out of uh, Judy Holiday's mouth. Barbara Stanley, don't do any publicity. Catherine Hepburn, the same thing. Uh, suddenly, these women who are superstars, Mary Astor, all four of them tell me, don't promote yourself. Stay back. She said, if you promote yourself, you're a flash of a pan. If you stay back, the work speaks for itself. The accumulation of work will not make you a superstar. It'll make you an institution. It was hard not getting a PR agent to come out and promote This kind of thing that I'm doing here is the first time in the, all these 45 years of acting that anyone has heard me say anybody. No publicity. 
that was hard because it's almost like living with that alien. Feelings, but I, um, I have such respect for those women. I might say that my career is because of four women who are on my back all the time. Mary asked her, every time I did a film, she called me and said, you lazy son of a bitch, I started moving tonight. <laughs> Reveal is just saying, oh, Yaku was so good this morning. Mary asked us on the phone, so you're a bastard, you got her actor, you a reactor. It wouldn't give me a break to a hard chick. That we respect her, we respect her films, but oh my God, they were awful. The second edition was an eight, but one of them came to see me in the Great White Hope after I replaced Jim Bill Jones. And my performance, I thought was great. And I looked out there and I said, I'm not going to tell you which one of them was sitting in the audience. You know, and everyone was reacting to her presence. And she just, I mean, so after that, it was over. Um, and people coming backstage and like, oh, yeah, it, you know, it's one of the performance. I'm looking at her, you know. I don't see her. The next night, you know, I'm going to play. You want to settle down. You, you don't want to uh, act because you're tired. With you. The other night was such a big hit. You were on stage while your friends were there. The next night, you're down. There's no way you can top the first night. You're down. So the second night, I decided to just, just go through it and go home. I walked through it, I didn't act. I walked through it, I came out and the people yeah. put it on. I go back in my dressing room, the door burst open, bam, you bastard, you don't do that. This is a theater. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember seeing these, uh, Catherine Hepburn and Mary Astor movies. Judy Hall, they know these women. I never thought that Thomas Martin's movie, they were going to be the people I'd be afraid of in life. <laughs> <laughs> Terrorized to do a bad job because they're going to show up. And if it wasn't for the four of them, I wouldn't be sitting here talking like this. So, uh, even David Gardner has something to do with my career, but if it wasn't for those professionals, and so it was easy for me to knock back off. And then I, I see it now. I, I, I see their words coming through now. I don't do any publicity. I got mail coming from Russia, China, England, France, Spain. Everyone knows who Yaka Koto is. It's become like something bigger than me. But I'm able to. I took 15 years off as a homicide quit. If I would not, look, if I was going to be a star, I wouldn't have quit. I was just, I wouldn't want more. But because, uh, because it was so much, I said, hold on, I don't need this. I took off. I went to the Philippines where I've been for the last 15 years. So, you're in so many films, and so obviously we have just a limited amount of time, but one of my favorite films of yours is Larry Cohen's first movie that he directed, Bone. How did you end up cast in that movie, and what was it like on the set of that film? I don't know how I got there, um, but I was suddenly there. I read the script, and I didn't realize that I'm going to have to do with this the story when this woman would be half naked all the time, every minute. And uh, that became the challenge. How to perform intimate scenes with a naked blonde body, blonde, blue-eyed, beautiful lady without becoming so attached to it that you forget what you're doing and you, you let your male thing take over. So it was, it was not easy. And the set had to be closed a lot of the times. A lot of the times, Joyce was naked and we would be doing, you know, and you can't help but be able to affect it, so it was very difficult. We got through it, and thank God, we got through it in a way that she could walk, or walk away feeling like I didn't take advantage of her nudity. I wasn't trying to come on her. But that was a big thing for me, to get over that. And then at the same time, remember it's a comedy, to do this hard, but that movie opened up the whole door, and it didn't. And Larry Cohen was so brave because NBC had me do the same kind of thing with uh, a thing called Albert Hitchcock Presents, but it was different because 
when they find out, the director didn't tell them black men were going to play the part. They didn't say Jaffa. And, they, and he says, Jaffa's playing this part. <laughs> so when myself and Christina Raines had to be emotional and intimate, there were five executives, I remember, sitting down surrounding us. Oh, that's too close. Don't go like that. What was it? He said, oh, these guys are crazy. Man, what's that? You know? But Bone was hard to do. But it, again, there was another movie that opened up the door for me. The black actors were now doing it so casually and freely without a problem. In those days, it was just me and Sydney. And uh, it, was, it was not easy. Live and Let Die, James Bond film. Multi-million dollar production. So, from the kind of work you've done on TV with the Westerns and uh, Gunsmoke and things like that, and then the films we're talking about now, then you go to a Bond movie, which is, uh, I guess they shot in Jamaica, did they shoot in Jamaica? All over the world. All over the world. So what was it like jumping into a movie like that, where it's just being thrown all over the place? I, I, I never look at, to protect myself, mm. I never look at what we're doing. I look at what we're all doing. What are we going to accomplish here? And the alien was the same thing. My task was to not let the alien kill me and to forget these huge sets. So what I had to do with DeBron was forget we were doing a James Bond movie and get into the fact that this man is coming is from British intelligence to kill you and destroy your world. As long as I could stay in contact with that. And that's a very good question, too, because I'll tell you what happened in the shooting of James Bond. As you do a Bond movie, the, the Ian Productions has a Bond spirit. You can't help but start getting caught up in that Bond thing. And the next thing you know, you're almost living like James Bond, you know, and you're flying planes and you're, you're tailoring all your suits and <laughs> surrounding yourself with beautiful women. And every day, you're, instead of going home, you're going to the gym and you're playing anger. My whole life started becoming Jane Bond, you know. And it took me a while to, for that to happen, and, but it also took me a while for it, like four years to get out of being Jane Bond, living like him, you know. So that's the danger of that. But it was, if, if a fantasy ever came true for me, uh, to be a part of the Bond family, even now, it's like, we still are, Jane and I and others, we still are connected with your production, and still that thing is with us, how, you know, how we live and what we do. Uh, once you get touched by, by the Bond, young people, you never, you never shake it off. You're still in that, and that, that, what that, way of living. Well, what was Roger Moore like working with Roger Moore? Roger is um, a prince. He often told him the guy from Hunter, but you want to get what he's happening. So my going to England and encountering men like Roger Moore was like, how can I explain it? To be an American, we live in a certain level of, of uh, crudity. The English live in a certain way. We're, we're, they're more refined than we are. One morning I got up and I was watching a commercial and a uh, woman came into the room, took off all her clothes, stripped naked and got into the shower and started showering. And the commercial said, oh, I always use, you know, our hospital soap. Well, me being a merch, it's, oh my God, this woman's new to me. And later on, turning the TV, there's two couples in bed making love to each other. And the children are watching, and the daddy's playing with mom's press, and, and here's me like, oh my God. So, the next day, going into the studio, I'm running from one person to another. Asking them, did you see the television last night? You know, what did you, what you watch in the early morning? Why? I got, well, this woman came in to foreclose. And you're looking at that. And I said, it must be something in the newspaper. I'm <laughs> 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 looking through the producer. 
put just for the outcry that I know is there. <laughs> Trading on the radio. Was there anything on the radio about a TV show about a couple making love in the bed that children weren't? No, Yarvin. This went through the whole thing. Friday, Roger came over and said to me, Yarvin, relax. You're in England now. <laughs> and that brought me down. So every time I show any of that, my American scene, I was told, you're in England now. And so I, I learned how to dress in England. I, it was a, uh, I learned to how to borrow my clothes. I realized as an American, we, I became English. You know, I learned how to wear all the same colors of clothes, not to have any mismatched clothes. We were quiet, and I so I became refined. And, uh, I tried to at least. Uh, be, so that's what they did. So that's what, who you answer that question? That's what Roger one did for me. He's a gentleman, and I learned how to be a little bit more refined. Being there. I wanted to achieve that in such an otherwise campy movie. It's a, you're like the not campy part of the movie. Let me tell you, Drum and another movie called um, Truck Turner were two movies that I did not want to do. Phone rings in my house and it's Isaac Hayes. Hey, you man. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac, I'm not doing that movie again. You know, grade B or no. <laughs> So I commit myself to the movie. The same thing with drunk. I run into Ken Norton on the street. He wants to leave me alone with a bloodless. Oh man, I gotta yell at Come on, I can't act there. So I said, all right. So those two movies I did them. Uh, a couple of other movies I let brothers Pam Grant talk me into doing some crazy things. And uh, I said, okay, you know, I, I can afford to, I didn't want to do those films, God. But, you know, your friends blackmail you into doing films. <laughs> Pam Grant really, oh, you white now. <laughs> 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 I said, okay, Pam, I'll do the AIP, <laughs> independent, no payment, mostly. Friday Post, if that's Friday Post. Friday Post, I'll do it, Pam, just got the fuck up. <laughs> I didn't have the strength to, you know. And you, they won't let you say, hey, man, I'm not doing that kind of movie, man. Come on, we talk about Friday Post, man. They won't let you. The human brothers and sisters not going to get away with that. <laughs> and Pam had an attitude about it. You know you're doing Friday Foster. Sorry, what can I do? I do Friday Foster. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I don't know. One last question, then we'll see if we can take a few from the audience. Sure. Midnight Run, which is, I read that oh, it's one role that you, it's a personal favorite of yours. Why do you like it, that role so much? Finding comedy is very hard to do. And finding comedy that can be done with a straight face is even more It was a challenge to me. So I said, if I can do this, I can do anything. And uh, the fact that Monty Brest was directing it, uh, it was a challenge. And I had, I had it, in my career, I was lucky, I'm lucky enough to be able to say no, yes, no. I, I don't, I've never auditioned for anything. But this was dangerous because I read this script and, I, and he said, make up your mind whether, whether you want to do it or not, let us know. I read it and tried it, and then finally he said, because when I first read it, it was so straight. I said, it's a danger here, it's, it's comedy, but it's straight. Can I do this? Finally I said, okay, I'll, let's, let's try it. And uh, people enjoy seeing it. But we worked damn near 20 hours a day, seven days a week on that movie, to the point that I would have fever, asthma, I was suffering from asthma at the time. I was, I was in pain every damn day. Money shoots 30, 50 takes a take. I, you know, I mean, it was the hardest work I ever did. And I just wanted it to be over with. Every scene that was in, I was in pain. My blood pressure was up way well, normal when the doctor was trying to get me this. Well, uh, I was taking 
aspirated all the time, asthma and couldn't breathe. This is the worst. The doctor didn't, he just would take one take after another take after. And we worked Saturday and Sunday. It was fluid location. I really thought that I was going to die in that moment. I really thought that this was going to be me. I really thought that my blood pressure was up so high. I thought this was it. As a matter of fact, I called my wife and I said, get the insurance place, I'm not going to make it home. <laughs> this is going to take me out. We, this is serious. I told her, I'm not going to make it after this. It's like a war. I said, you know, and she, came, she started crying all over the phone. And I said, I'm not, I just can't. Because, you know, when you're having high blood pressure, your things are waving and crying. So each scene became more and more harder to do, more and more of a challenge. And so each day I got up, I saw I was facing death. I don't even want to tell you how my blood, how high my blood pressure was. Uh, so it had to be. So when people tell me how much they enjoyed it, I never say anything to people. I said, oh, it's coming back here. But that was the worst movie that I've ever done. It was worse. And it was, I'm not going to talk about other people in the company, but I'll say this much. Everybody was going through what I was going Everyone was one out. De Niro, Grown, every wall, one out. People think it's funny. Um, the, these movies are, are almost life and death. It's, it's not an enjoyable thing. Very hard. I get emotional when I think about Big Night Run. I'm really emotional. I, I don't go to see it and I don't talk about it much. Um, we only have room uh, for a few questions, so uh, please try to keep them where they can be answered. Like, yes. Uh, one of the, you're the real deal. When when I whenever I would see a movie, didn't know you were in it, and you would show up in the movie, I said, "Wow, this is good. no matter what kind of movie it was, I knew it was going to be a terrific movie." That can, I can I can I can thank Lee Strasberg and the Actors Studio, Molly Kazan, and all the people in that little trip on Fifty Second Street for that. Yeah. Uh, Real quick, Thomas Crown up there, uh, a little bit about that. It was a, my first, yeah, second uh, movie. The minute, the minute I saw you on the scene doing those montages in the beginning where Steve is calling up each of the budget, in Star Chamber and Liberation of L.B. Jones, I mean, every movie... As I say, this is to be contributed to the actor's studio when we start from. Yeah. There's not such thing as the little actor or little part. If you've been trained well and studied, I've done like 60 plays, okay? I, was, I spent my life off Broadway, and I spent my life in that studio at the church under Max, Lee Strasberg. So whether the part is three words, 100,000, you still have the interior life. You still have the super objective, the focus. You still have it. It doesn't matter how many words you say. So when you come in into a scene, if that, is, if that intent is in your head and in your heart, Forget the damn camera and the director and the crew. Forget them. Keep that intent in your heart and head, the focus. Forget the camera. And once you do that, the camera finds the truth of that moment. Whatever, whatever your method is, it works. You, you, well, I, said, I'm you telling you, the a, method, a man wrote a book, two books, building a character and an act prepared. Constant teams out of sauce. Once you've read those two books and understand them, whether you're an actor, a dancer, a musician, a police officer, you can be true to the moment that you're working. Doesn't you don't have to be an actor to understand them. Once you understand the method, you should you can carry it out in life. If you're a violinist, salesman, doesn't matter. You don't have to be an actor to live by the method. But my wife and I love you. We just want you to know this. Thank you. You're, you're Thank phenomenal. You. One more, sir. I was working with Arnold Right. Arnold's a gracious uh, guy who's not afraid to say, I don't know how to play the scene. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot from him. You know, him. Just, uh, he's, he's one of the few actors that said to me, you know, De Niro reference said to me, he says, if you have, yeah, but when the movie is over, if you ever need me, give me a call. So I said, okay, he's just a great guy, you know. So if I ever got in trouble, you know, with my career, I had some problems, 
both he and Rafferty called me to, to uh, give them a call back with me. Because we, 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 the active community, we all are in contact. Every one of us are in constant contact with each other. We're constantly called. So I came to Canada to talk to members <coughs> of alien who are in the Catholic Movement coming here. So we're in constant communication. And sometimes somebody's career drops out a little bit. You get this guy come and say, man, you need a Don't worry, I've got it for you. So we all keep up in the community, so we all keep working. Your, your friends keep it going. Well, please visit Yafit Koto at his table all weekend. He's here the rest of the day, all day tomorrow. Tons of great stories. Definitely stop and visit him. And um, let's thank him for yes. taking Can the I just say this? But the reason why I started to do these conventions because we, uh, uh, we're, I live in the Philippines, and uh, my wife and I know this, that these letters from people in the business, from people from around the world keep saying, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? When are you coming back? So I said, I have to find a way of coming back. I just don't want to start working. Just let's do these conventions. Let's find out what's happening with people out there, what's going down. And, and I've come down to uh, America, and the lady right here, she said something to me yesterday that spooked me out. <laughs> before I left here, before I left here, uh, the late Sandra Davis Jr.'s assistant, I think it was Annie Spider, looks exactly like her. She called me and she said, yeah, but I'm, you're coming back, you're starting out here. So she said, you gotta come back, you absolutely must. And she made such a big thing out of it. See, I believe when God speaks to you, he speaks to you through other people. She and this lady said the exact same words to me. Come back to the screen. So I said, damn it, <laughs> Catherine Edward. <laughs> Julie Holiday said, stay away from promoting. She said, I said, why? She says, because they, and when they want you back, the public will tell you. And the public will tell you. And we're going to keep doing these conventions until there's a Yafikoro movement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.